So good morning. Um, welcome to, to this session, which is entitled SLAPS in today's uh, independent investigative media landscape. Um, my name is Paul Hughes. I'm the legal director at uh, Media Defence. Um, we're an NGO based in London. We provide support to journalists who are facing uh, legal threats all around the world. We support hundreds of cases involving journalists facing legal threats every year. Many of those cases are slap cases, and we see those cases coming in from places like Brazil and Nigeria, Vietnam, and Azerbaijan. So it's a, the, a very diverse set of cases that come to us uh, in the form of slaps. And those cases um, share a lot of commonalities and there's a lot of common features in the way in which they're, um, they're con conducted. Um, well, primarily, the, one of the primary purposes for the way in which these cases are brought is to exhaust the financial resources of the and the journalist or the media house that's that's being uh, sued. But there's there's other common features across these regions and these states, um, which are which are also playing out in the context of of slap cases, like designing and conducting the litigation in order to. Um, in order to exhaust the the psychological resources and then also also to use up the 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 time that the journalist or the media house would, would otherwise have um in order to carry out their work um engaging in investigative journalism on 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 public interest um matters and then there's also the um the the chilling effect that these cases have as as very eloquently stated at the beginning of of the day the impact they have the fact that these cases being brought against one journalist uh, has a chilling effect, not just on that journalist or on that media house, but a broader um, chilling effect, which affects the 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 um, the journalistic landscape in that particular um, that particular uh, state. And this is uh, particularly problematic for independent media. So those journalists who don't have the support or the resources to fall back on, which would provide them with that comfort of knowing they have the support, they have the legal support, they have the advice, um, and they have the financial support to resist uh, these types of, of cases. So the, resisting these cases becomes extremely difficult in, in that context. And that's where media defense comes in. We try where we can to, to provide financial support um, to the lawyers who are working with the journalists um, uh, in, in these states. So uh, this morning we, we have a unfortunately we have a depleted panel. We have um, uh, two panelists um, who will talk about two journalists who will talk about the first-hand practical impact of slaps on them, on their work, on their practices, on the way in which they have conducted themselves, and the kind of overarching impact of of slaps on their their day-to-day -day lives and 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 how it's impacted on the way in which they they've conducted their their journalistic um their journalistic work um they'll also talk about the impact of the kind of ancillary effects of slaps in 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 the in the context of other types of harassment um being imposed or being brought against them by the individuals who are suing them and by the state um in certain circumstances where those individuals are in collusion with or, or are working with um uh, with the state. So I'm joined, um, first of all, by uh, Claire Rucastle brown Claire is a, an investigative journalist who uh, investigates issues such as the environment, human rights, um, corruption. She founded the Sarawak Report in Indonesia in 2010. She also founded Radio Free Sarawak. She was uh, prominent in exposing the 1MDB scandal. Uh, a consequence of which she's she's suffered from serious legal um, harassment through various lawsuits being being brought against her and other efforts by individuals in positions of of authority to to put pressure um, on her. I'm also joined by um, Scott Stedman. Scott, many of you will be familiar with Scott's case, which is currently going through the uh, the, the London High Court. Scott is an investigative journalist with Forensic News. Um, which is a long, long form investigative um, online um, newspaper. So perhaps first of all, Claire, I'll, I'll hand to you to tell us a little bit about your experience with, with SLAPS. Well, yes, it was um, very moving listening to Carol's experience and um, it, it, 
you reminded me of the, how, how many similarities there are. I, I, the latest case that I actually had get as far as the High Court, um, I was also in this Kafka-esque situation of um, having to defend myself um, against someone I'd never written about, whose name I'd never actually uh, put into uh, my blog. Um, and again, a, a meaning had been devised that was actually, it never reached uh, a decision by, by the High Court or, or the judge. Um, uh, you, uh, 500,000 uh, pounds down the road in the case, uh, meaning had yet to be decided in my, in my, or from my side, uh, at least well over a million pounds um, on the litigant side, um, that had yet to be addressed. So I was being dragged through um, a high court case uh, by someone I'd never um, named. Um, and in fact, that put the burden on me to to actually prove it. he'd um, he'd done what I'd never said he'd done. <laughs> and, and luckily, I managed to dig out quite a lot more proof um, in that direction on the subject of um, this particular politician receiving money um, from from another political party. But um, those sorts of things are incredibly stressful, and and also very much like Carol, within the course of that, I ended up having to actually file a counter harassment suit because um, private details from that case uh, were being released to malicious uh, third parties and bloggers um, and used as part of a coordinated defamation campaign against me. Um, I, I'm a bit of a veteran of uh, libel suits. Uh, most of them don't come to court. I've, I've had dozens and dozens of um, aggressive letters, threats and all the rest um, because I've, I've been dealing with high scale, high level corruption um, involving um, very powerful um, and wealthy people um, in different parts of the world. Uh, and the lawsuit is um, rarely um, the sole manifestation of these people coming after you. Um, and, um, you know, you, 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 you soon become aware that these are people who are trying to get you. Uh, in one particular case, um, I subsequently learned from someone who was in the room um, that a very senior royal personage from far away um, had, had discussed how to deal with the fact that I'd exposed them um, for having money laundered several billion um, and it was discussed whether I could be bought. Um, it was decided possibly that would be a bad and unlikely, I don't know if any they'd asked. Um, that then um, they decided, well, could, they, could I be disposed of? Um, and apparently that, that was considered risky. Um, but never mind, they had a legal option. So they came after me legally. Um, and when they do that, um, I think one has to realize you're dealing and, and, and the lawyers who take on these clients must know that they are very often dealing with highly unsavory people. Um, and um, I have found myself the subject of um, numerous defamation blogs, Facebook sites, campaigns, um, all designed to destroy as and defame you, destroy you as a credible person um, in the eyes of your fellow professionals. Um, you know, the, the other newspapers will get letters that allege the most dreadful and defamatory things about you under that label of private and confidential. Um, and, um, uh, you, you know, you're, you're facing a full scale attack, um, an anonymously funded, of course, um, on, on you. It involves hacking. Um, I had my mobile phone at one point um, stolen from me in the ladies changing room of the swimming baths. And within 24 hours, my entire Gmail was uploaded onto a Malaysian website, uh, tampered with and then used to um, actually, you know, funnel all sorts of it. it informed a bogus PR campaign whereby newspaper organizations here um, were informed that I'd done this, that and the other. And I was finding myself having to defend my position and prove myself um, to um, sympathetic in the end public uh, Sunday Times journalists and others who, who rang me up and said, oh, this seems to have come out about you. Um, um, so, it, as, as Carol's described, um, you're, you're dealing, w w you know, with 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 hacking, um, surveillance 
um, very public surveillance where I found that I was being very obviously demonstrably followed around um, and then my meetings would then go up on, on you know one of the attack blogs um, pictures of me talking to people and that sort of thing very deliberate um, and, 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 and alongside that you have law firms who are you know they, they seem to they seem to feel they have impunity and you know I feel other professions have had a wake-up call and I think it's time that the legal profession had a wake-up call on this. I, I can think of no boardroom um, or business situation or you know where people would be spoken to in the way that lawyers feel entitled to address their targets. The, the, the language I have received, the accusations, um, I, I mean, to be honest, I'm a bit of a hard boiled egg. You know, I, I laugh it off these days. But, um, you know, the aggressive nature of their communications is, is it's not, you know, it's not the world we live in and it's not acceptable. And I don't know why they think they can still get away with it. And the sort of cross examination that Carol received, there's no need to be rude and abusive. Nobody else does it. Why do they think they can bully people in this way? So I, I think code of conduct needs to be really looked at. Um, th th there's this sense of impunity, and you can see why. For, for most of these law firms, it seems to be a kind of game. Um, you know, uh, big organisations, um, you know, it was a very good analogy made yesterday, the BBC, it's like a, a bunch of midges coming at you. Um, and, um, you know, that is very off-putting and chilling. But for someone like me, it's like a frigging pterodactyl coming at you because I have no money with it to protect myself. Um, and so um, these people are, are real threats. Um, and, um, you know, we, they know this and that's what they're game plan is to bully the small journalist. Um, and um, ironically, you know, I've worked most of my life in mainstream media. I then took myself out and went after a subject that mainstream media weren't covering. Um, and so therefore, you know, like so many journalists, NGOs now, I, I was actually coming from a position of commitment. In a way, that gave me a strength. I wasn't trying to keep a business afloat. I wasn't trying to keep people in jobs. I wasn't trying having to make decisions between this and that. I had a focus. Um, and therefore, actually, in some ways, I'm a tougher nut to crack. Um, I'm not going to get bullied off something um, I feel strongly is correct. And, and, and the, we are quite a growing number of actors in this space. Um, I, in the last few months, have taken up stories that I know perfectly well big mainstream uh, uh, law firms have gone after big newspapers who were interested in the particular stories, and they backed off, and I wrote about it. Um, so so this, is, this is a concern. We do have a role to play, people like me. We do un investigate things that other bigger organizations are being successfully kept off by this kind of behavior. And I think this sense of impunity, this sense that they can get away with behaving like this and there's going to be no comeback for them. They'll earn their money. If they lose the case, it's somebody else's problem. It's not theirs. And there seems to be a lack of oversight as to their behavior. And, and there's a particular issue that really worries me. All those people who were following after me, all those people who were hacking me, all those people who were trying to intimidate me, those PR companies um, that wrote all those um, really awful things on Facebook sites using bogus Twitter and Facebook bots to pretend that they were somebody who thought I was awful from the public. They're being paid more often than not through the law firms that have been hired. And this is becoming an increasing phenomenon. Uh, the uh, reputation management uh, departments of um, law firms that cater to these ultra high net worth individuals are completely open about what they're up to. Um, they are then using the money through that provided to them through their client accounts to hire PR and that is an unregulated industry. And then you see, uh, you know, that money is unscrutinized as it can travel through to some of the very bad things that then happen. And I think law firms have to be made much more accountable to the, the, the origin of the money they receive and where it goes.
Thank you, Claire. Um, so in our work um, from an international perspective, we, even though we don't work in the UK, we don't have real connections with um, the legal issues that arise in the context of the High Court in London, we do see these um, London law firms working abroad in other contexts, providing that kind of reputation management um, and, and reputation um, laundering and advising um, on the way in which to, to prosecute these kind of slap um, cases. Uh, Scott, you also have, um, unfortunately, you also have um, particular experience of being sued in in the UK. And I think you were facing five separate causes of action at one stage. You were being sued for libel, data breach, misuse of private information, harassment and a malicious falsehood. Perhaps um, you can talk about that, how, how your case has progressed, how those five causes of action have been dealt with and where you are now in relation to, to the litigation brought against you. Sure. Well, thank you so much um, for having me and for everyone um, holding this important conference. Um, like Claire, I want to share a little bit more about um, what it means to be a journalist, an independent journalist battling a slap. In the late summer of 2020, I was served a wide ranging lawsuit by a businessman halfway around the world from where I was. I just returned home from an afternoon with friends when I noticed that a gray sedan was parked outside of my house. I walked inside and was followed by this unknown man, and a few seconds after I shut the door, he knocked. I answered, and he handed me a, a stack of legal papers about three inches thick, and he said just one phrase to me, and that was, this is from Mr. Soriano. By then, I was accustomed to legal threats. Um, months prior, for example, a representative for Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska, um, one of Putin's most trusted uh, oligarchs and allies, wrote to me and demanded, you must provide him with all of my sources and any documentation, public or otherwise. Days later, I ran a story about how a British-Israeli businessman named Walter Soriano was one of Deripaska's most trusted covert operatives. Soriano's process server was then waiting for me um, about two months later. The legal papers were a sweeping lawsuit against me personally, my company, and my colleagues, alleg alleging a vast conspiracy to libel Soriano. Nearly every possible charge associated with a slap was included at first. Libel, harassment, malicious falsehood, and alleged violations of GDPR and privacy laws. I've never been to the UK. I have no business presence in the UK. I don't have a bank account in the UK. I really have nothing to do with the UK at all. Um, all I've known is the US uh, thus far in my life, but I soon anticipate that's gonna change um, sitting in a London courtroom in, in March and later for a trial. Soriano filed the lawsuit in London where he resides, but after a year of fighting the jurisdiction of the case, UK judges determined that I must answer to some of Soriano's claims um, and defend my journalism from 5,000 miles away. The reasoning in part was that I had six subscriptions in pounds, sterling, and in euros, and that apparently gave the UK jurisdiction for the GDPR claim to move forward. So approximately $40 in revenue um, in foreign, foreign currency has now costed me tens of thousands in legal bills. Despite the lack of any connection to the UK, the weapon of a slap lawsuit is so powerful that it's forced me to spend way too much of my time tending to legal matters and bolstering my defense, as Claire had mentioned. So after 868 days, um, the end of the legal battles nowhere in sight. Um, and I'm told that I'll be lucky to have a full trial um, at the end of 2023. These kinds of abusive lawsuits are eroding democracies all over the world. And the use of this tool of a slap for the wealthy has become much more prevalent as Claire, Caroline, Tom Burgess, Catherine Belton, and so many others um, who have felt this unique stress. As I stated in my testimony to the Helsinki Commission in Congress in April, these slap lawsuits are not meant to vindicate one's reputation, uh, but instead to punish the journalists for reporting that exposes some uncomfortable truths. They're designed to intimidate journalists and silence us and inflict personal hardship 
uh, financially. In 2022 alone, I've spent nearly $30,000 of my own money and I've raised $36,000 more um, to build my defense and for lawyer fees. The repercussions of a slap lawsuit are monumental. For example, how many independent journalists have been strong-armed into silence? And independent journalists are, by the way, most at risk because we don't have a team of lawyers at our disposal or the big media backing. How many exposés have been stripped of crucial details because of the threat of expensive, exhausting litigation? How many secrets of the powerful have been kept in the shadows? The ability of journalists to report on the dealings of those who hold power is a cornerstone of any functioning democracy. There must be protections for those who report on matters of public interests in a fair, transparent, and evidentiary-based manner. And this also should be a, a nonpartisan issue. We can tackle this major threat to a democracy at a time when it seems teetering. So thank you again for having me, and I look forward to any questions anyone might have. Great. Thank you, Scott. And this idea of of tenuous connection between between um, individuals writing outside of the UK and being being sued in the UK is obviously a a massive um, a massive problem that should be addressed in in the context of both the EU and the the UK's anti-slap um, developments. Where we were to be joined by Caroline um, Musket and by Anna Berrichano, um, neither of whom could make it. So I'm just going to mention um, Anna Berrichano's case that we're supporting in in Colombia, which relates to um, uh, a series of, of slap cases that have been issued against uh, two journalists. These two journalists have written extensively about a, a high profile movie director in Colombia who's alleged to have sexually assaulted up to to nine people who was who was working with him um, during the course of his his filmmaking. Um, when they wrote about uh, this story, they were sued in the civil courts for a million dollars. A criminal defamation case was was brought against them, and then a what's called a tutela, which is quite unique to to Latin America. It's a it's a form of constitutional um, um, legal process whereby somebody applies to the constitutional court in order to vindicate a a specific human right. A tutela was issued against the journalists um, on the basis that the cases that were being considered by the the courts in the civil and criminal defamation cases weren't being dealt with um, quickly enough. And that's kind of ironic because in normal circumstances, you'd expect the tutela to be issued by the journalist who would want to vindicate their right to to, to freedom of expression. So that case, those three cases are are ongoing. Media defense is supporting those three cases, and we've um, intervened as an amicus in, in one of those um, cases. And coming out of that situation in Colombia, you have um, an organization that we work quite closely with, El Vente, um, which was um, uh, founded by one of my former colleagues, Emmanuel Vargas, uh, taking a constitutional case against the government for its failure to put in place the legal framework to protect journalists from these kinds of, of, of cases. And I think that's an important um, uh, legal case to take where you're insisting there's a positive obligation on the state to put this framework in place. We use this, <clears throat> this phrase from a, a case from the European Court of Human Rights in a lot of the work we do, a case called Dink versus Turkey, where the court talks about implementing a, um, uh, sorry, th there's a positive obligation on states to implement a positive framework of laws to protect um, freedom of expression. So that's a, just one sentence from this case that we continually emphasize to the court that this is an important thing that states should be doing. And in the Colombian context with Olvente, this case is now going through the constitutional court where they're looking for this quite um, ambitious um, judgment that would insist that the state has a positive obligation in Colombia to implement a new legal framework to protect journalists. And that is kind of connected to the the, the case that was brought by by the movie director. At least that was the catalyst for implementing, uh, for, for initiating um, the legal um, proceedings. Um, we have an intervention from the floor. Dario, perhaps you can uh, you can make your intervention. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. Nice to see everyone again. Um, I wanted to talk about a, a case in South Africa where I, where I practice, and in fact, which uh, we are intervening for a number of free speech organizations in the case next week, Thursday, in um, the Peter Maritzburg High Court. Um, the case, in, you might have read about it, it involves um, my uh, old friend, President Zuma, who uh, I, I mentioned it in, in my address last year and I spoke about the uh, numerous defamation civil lawsuits he had brought against the media when he was president um, and, and how, you know, uh, as uh, slaps, we were able to um, force him to withdraw one, which created a domino effect, and, and he effectively ev uh, had to withdraw all the others. But what he's done most recently is, is actually far more egregious than these civil cases. Um, he is finally being prosecuted for corruption, for his uh, conduct when he was president, um, and, and that's um, the pro a prosecution that's ongoing. And in the course of that prosecution, there's a reporter Karen Morn, who's a very experienced legal reporter in South Africa. Um, and she has been at every day of his hearing. And in fact, she's been in following Zuma's various legal battles, including his um, corruption case for many, many years. So she is the journalist in South Africa with the most institutional knowledge about the corruption case against President Zuma. So she's obviously been at all the hearing uh, dates and following it very closely. Um, and what happened was, well, she probably applied makeup before she went to court as well. Uh, what happened was that in the course of reporting uh, on, on one of the particular interventions in the case, it was a postponement where President Zuma applied to postpone the hearing on account of medical health. I hope that's not being broadcast live, and, and I am, but perhaps that's more interesting. Um, and in her postponement, in President Zuma's postponement application, um, he had attached a medical certificate. So it's a court pay, court document, an affidavit, an annexure being a medical certificate. Uh, and the medical certificate said that he's not fit to stand trial on those particular days uh, and didn't disclose the medical condition that was afflicting President Zuma, former President Zuma, but nevertheless, um, was was the reason that his legal team asked for a postponement. Um, Aaron Morn, who's the journalist, reported on this postponement application because once applications are are served, they become court documents. So I'm sure in common with many jurisdictions, once um, court papers are filed in court, they become public court documents. So what Morn did as a journalist is what court reporters do around the world every day. She got access to the court papers from the prosecutors, right? And she published a story based on this. And the story said, Zuma has applied for a postponement on the grounds of, of uh, medical health. Um, she summarized the medical certificate, which didn't disclose the medical condition. And, uh, and, and that's why the case was being postponed on that particular day. What Zuma then did is he laid a criminal charge um, in relation to the disclosure of his medical records uh, and his medical condition. And he said that this is a egregious breach of his dignity and privacy, and that both the prosecutor who gave this affidavit to, which was public, by the way, as I said, the prosecutor who gave this affidavit to the journalist and the journalist herself should be prosecuted. Our National Prosecuting Authority did the obvious thing, which is to say there is no case here. Um, it's a public document. It's a court document. It was filed by President Zuma himself. Um, and there's nothing wrong in what the journalist did or what the prosecutor did in giving the journalist um, access to the court document. Our law, and I think in common also with many jurisdictions, also has a system of private prosecution. So that if you lay a criminal complaint and the prosecutors decide not to prosecute, you are entitled to privately prosecute. And that is exactly what President Zuma is doing now. So he has brought a private prosecution, which could result in a jail term, both against the prosecutor, who's prosecuting him for corruption, and against the journalists for disclosing this, um, this affidavit, which has the medical certificates. And in fact, it was an extremely chilling sight to see the journalists in the dock, in the criminal dock, 
um, a few months ago when she was uh, had to attend the first day of this criminal hearing. Um, so there she was in the dock um, on the first day. And of course, the fact that President Zuma is prosecuting her for corruption resulted in massive misogyny, massive uh, harassment, both online and offline. She's faced death threats. Um, in fact, I'm going to read out some of the um, some of the the tweets that have been published, uh, and 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 in fact, some of these are from President Zuma's supporters, uh, family. Uh, one is from his daughter, uh, and and usually with a mock-up picture of her in orange uniform, which which is of course uh, the uniform of prisoners. Um, you look good in orange, sissy, says uh, President Zuma's daughter, tagging her on Twitter. Um, she says. According to your white laws, you are a criminal. Karen Morney is a white journalist, so she's faced lots of racist comments about her. Um, she was yesterday served with the sheriff for breaking the law. Accused number two, Karen Morn, looks to serve up to 15 years in prison when found guilty. Um, she says in her affidavit, I've been referred to as a thing, a bitch, a lying bitch, a white bitch, a witch, a racist, a pig, an alcoholic, a criminal, a hypocrite, a propaganda journalist, a racist, a servant of white privilege, a hack and an askari, which is in South Africa, the term used for a traitor. Um, and in the context of, of all of that online harassment, um, she has brought an application to strike out the criminal prosecution as an abuse of process. As I say, we, for a number of free speech organizations, are joining that fight next week. We're going to ask the court for permission to intervene. And what the couple of points I want to make in the context of this panel and also in the uh, after hearing the very moving testimony earlier today, the one is that, of course, what Zuma could have done if this was a legitimate complaint against the journalist was to go to the self-regulatory body. We have a press council. If the media had wrongly published any private information, um, he could have gone there. He could have also gone to the regulator who does data protect protection work. Um, and and th th there were those fora that were available for him. He could have sued the newspaper who employs the journalist because she was a freelance journalist, but then became an employee, formal employee of the newspaper. He chose not to do, to do that either. He chose to go the criminal route. And although we have criminal defamation in our law, it hasn't been used against journalists for decades. Um, and uh, in fact, the ruling party has promised that criminal defamation will be struck from our, our, our uh, statute books in, in due course. So Zuma, what he did is he dusted off um, a section in the Criminal Procedure Act very obscure provision, which says that no one is entitled to publish a document in the possession of the prosecuting authority. And he says, well, that's exactly what's happened here. The prosecuting authority got my affidavit. They gave it to a journalist and the journalist published that. And that's a breach of that particular section. And of course, what he doesn't say, however, is that once it becomes a public record, it would be completely absurd to read the section as precluding your rights to publish based on that. So um, he's using an, a highly technical, absurd interpretation of a very obscure provision of a statute and taking it completely out of context to prosecute the journalist and his own prosecutor for breaching um, this particular criminal law. So the first point that struck me as I recount this to you is that specific, and that's why we argue this is a slap case, that specific targeting of the journalist individually as opposed to going after the news corporation that um, that employs her. The second uh, striking feature of this is the solidarity which you spoke about and which I think is is a hallmark of this particular case because of course it has rallied all the media corporations no matter what their um, leaning is in favor of the journalist. It has brought together a number of NGOs, including the ones I represent, to not only engage in the legal advocacy, to argue that this is a slap, and of course, with our recent judgment, it makes our argument more powerful, but also to argue uh, and advocate for law reform so that so that these kinds of cases can't occur. Um, and, and thirdly, I think it, it, it possibly contrary to Zuma's expectation, her um, organization is supporting her, both legally and financially. She's a very seasoned journalist. She's a very experienced journalist. Um, but she sent me a message saying, I'm so grateful that um, your clients are intervening um, and uh, I'm doing as well as can be expected in the circumstances. 
and um, and it, it it reminded me of 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 the, um, the cartoonist who I represented when Zuma went uh, launched his civil claims against against the media a number of years ago. Again, a very well respected and and famous cartoonist who's won a number of international awards, but who said that um, you know had he not had the legal support and the moral support. Um, it would have been debilitating. So I thought I would just end on those reflections, which I think tie neatly with what we've heard this morning and clear your testimony as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dario. Um, should we take questions from, from the floor? Hi, it's a question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it's a question for Scott. Uh, hey, Scott, this is Nick from Index. Um, I just want to dig into, because after your case, there's been a number of, similar to what happened to Carol, this connected sort of harassment smear campaign against you and against your defense and crowdfunding. And I just want to ask how that's informed your response to the, the legal threat and, and also just so everyone's aware of that side of it, because I think it's a really important aspect of the threats and the harassment that you've been facing thanks yeah i i completely agree and and like claire said um you know this is a through line with a lot of the slap cases that we're looking at um so for me personally i have this uh, kind of coordinated twitter campaign right now that's uh, releasing my direct messages with some folks and actually doctoring the messages and deleting responses so it makes it you know, makes the conversation look 10 times worse. Um, and uh, I'm a little bit limited in, in what I can say in, in regards to the harassment stuff, just because this is ongoing. But, uh, I, you know, I can certainly vouch that this is one prong of kind of the psychological um, attack that you face when big money and, um, you know, these, these corporate players are... Um, really going after you not only legally but um as has been discussed you know psychologically and uh through social media and other means so harassment is a a giant issue with with me right now i'm losing a little bit of sleep over it um but you know i'm confident that in the end everything will work out and um you know i have not bribed anyone or uh plagiarized uh, contrary to what you may have seen on on twitter recently Thanks, Scott. Um, anyone have any other other questions down the back? Yeah, it's just, it's just interesting that you um, spoke about criminal libel because, you know, Scott was just talking about the the, the um, effect that it has on people personally, and Tom was Burgess was speaking yesterday about you know sleepless nights, etc. But the ultimate slap, I think, is the criminal libel. Um, which, uh, you know, I, we hear that is still going in South Africa, but also I'm, I'm from HarperCollins, um, who published um, Tom and Catherine's books. Um, but in, in, in it, we've got a subsidiary in India where criminal libel is used a lot. And the threat is not only to the, to the journalists, but the officers of the company that you end up in, you know, there's a likelihood you can end up in prison. Now, that's the ultimate slap. And I just wondered if there's any anyone else has had experience of, of criminal libels around the world? Yeah, I've, I've got one uh, standing against me in Malaysia. Um, so um, that was brought in tandem with um, a civil case um, where um, the lady concerned wanted me to pay her $100 million. Um, the civil case is actually finally, after about four years, um, been dismissed um, on the basis that I did not defame the litigant. Um, but um, the criminal libel against me is, is still going through the courts in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and in tandem with that, the government has issued um, an Interpol arrest warrant for me. Um, a so-called red notice. It's the second time that the Malaysian government have done that, um, which has uh, had the effect of impeding my travel. So I have to think very hard about going through airports around the world, just in case, um, just in case somebody thinks it'd be a good idea to hold me up on the basis of that um, of that red notice alert. Um, and there are many journalists who have been um, held up. Um, and put in jail in airports around the world on just that kind of malicious activity. 
So it's a real, it's a real uh, added threat, you know, if, if you're dealing with politically powerful as well as wealthy people. Most of them are both. Malaysia, is that right? Mm -hmm. It means that you won't go to Malaysia, is that correct? Oh, gosh, I, no, I'd be very unwise to go to Malaysia, but, um, you know, there are other potentially sympathetic areas of the world um, where I, I would also not go to as a result of that alert. And, and of course, it's not just eventually, thanks to, largely to the intervention of some of the um, excellent organizations represented here, um, Interpol did um, issue an assurance that they wouldn't be advising that internationally. But you can have bilateral arrangements between countries. Um, so you're not just off the hook just because Interpol has, has written off this request. Great. Any, any other? Carl? Claire, you've been, oh, is it there? Sorry. Hi, Claire. So, and Scott, hi, both. Um, Claire, you've been so brave taking on this multifaceted investigation and publishing this all alone. Do you, you know, how could the mainstream media or journalists here have supported you more? Like, what would actually be helpful for you? And do you feel that you sort of, you have been, um, that you have been ignored or neglected in sense of sort of media solidarity for for for, for what you're doing. Well, um, unlike you, actually, I had gone completely solo, um, and so I, you know, I can't, you know, but I did take my my material to other newspapers and in fact um, quite a lot of those newspapers got quite a lot of plaudits and awards and Pulitzers and things uh, from running my material. Um, but y you're right, um, they were equally um, easy for um, the people going after me to put off. Um, and, um, you know, I would find, and, and it was very informative to me, how um, this kind of harassment and bullying is, is hugely effective, not just against small little midgets like me, but as, as I mentioned earlier, even more so, troublingly, against the mainstream media, because large media organisations, have several of these cases potentially at any one time. Um, you know, they have to pick and choose. They have got a business to worry about. Um, and, you know, they will back off. And, and I've had situations where, um, you know, I've taken a story, we've agreed to run it. And then, you know, a couple of, um, well, I've had several situations of that nature, um, you know, after a couple of letters from um, large law firms in London, um, suddenly, you know, the uh, appetite has vanished. Um, and, and I find myself on my own again. And, and then often, you know, I, I've had, you know, I, I've had insight into the sorts of things that are written about me to those newspapers by the journalists, by the, the law firms concerned. You know, I'm, a, I'm naturally, I'm a mad woman, um, deranged. I'm, I'm paid by the opposition. I have a, you know, I have a left wing passion. Um, you know, there are all sorts of things that I didn't know were motivating me. You know, I, I'm, I'm actually someone who thinks that it's right to call out corruption and, and I have a bias against lawbreakers. That's as far as it goes. Um, but you know, you're 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 expected to suffer enormous defamation of you um, within the, the very important profession, you know, the people who I go to to try and um, sell stories to, so might to, to be to be hired by. Um, and and you know, so you find yourself becoming treated as a hot potato. Um, so, but I don't know to what extent, I, I, you know, I, I think that um, we need to recalibrate, uh, you know, I, I don't think I can t blame uh, the mainstream media, um, but I, I, for, for not protecting me more, but I do, I do think they need to stand up and not be intimidated in the way that they are being, or find a way not to be. Great. We have um, a question from someone who's, who's um, looking online. Have the solicitors who acted for the persons bringing actions against the journalists we've heard from been invited to attend today? If so, are they here? If not, why not? I'm sure they would give you an opportunity to give, uh, you would give them an opportunity to give their side of the story. If they're silent, we can draw our own conclusions. And I suspect that relates to all of the law firms that are acting on behalf of the claimants who are issuing these aggressive um, letters are bringing these 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 claims. Does anyone want to to address that? Because in the UK's consultation, there was a sense that submissions were being made in relation to the slap laws concerning 
um, the question of access to justice and whether this uh, implementation of an anti-SLAPP law would impact on the right of access, access to justice. Yeah, I mean, I think they're always going to say that libel laws are there for a reason. And in fact, in Carol's case, um, Mrs. Justice Stain said it wasn't a slap because there was a right there that had to be protected and libel and related laws about reputation are meant to balance that out. But I think that absolutely misses the point. And I think a lot of the claimant lawyers, well, I'm not sure that any are here today, but they are talking out and they are saying that this is misplaced. There isn't a problem. Um, I'm a newspaper lawyer, so I obviously have a different view. But uh, it's, it is absolutely missing the point. It's not as though people are saying those rights won't be protected. If a publisher or a journalist gets something wrong, I believe there is an obligation to try and fix it. But that isn't the point we're trying to address here. It's not about extinguishing rights. It's about redressing the balance. Absolutely. Thank you. So I just jump in. Sure. So often the letters you'll get, the ulterior motive is so clear. You know, um, we'll do all these dreadful things to you um, because allegedly you have done this or that. Um, if, on the other hand, you remove everything you've ever written about our client and promise never to write about him ever again, um, you know, then then you'll be let off. Um, and of course, you know, we'll 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 make the point to everyone else who's written about him that you've backed off as, as the source on this story. It's so blatant. Um, and, and, and indeed, the, um, the case that came to court, um, in my case, the, the, the Malaysian politician, um, he finally beetled off and, and gave me the, you know, the majority of my um, uh, expenses um, and um, dropped the case um, uh, and then justified it in the Malaysian media saying, well, it was only because the election was coming up. Um, and and frankly, now the election's over and we did very well. I mean, I don't care about my reputation in Britain. It was for my own political purposes back here. It, you know, he admitted it was a slap case. Um, so, you know, it, the, the, the spurious, um, you know, um, the, the um, ulterior motive is, is always nearly very clear. Yeah. If I could just add one point really quickly. This kind of goes back to the question about um, solicitors and, and lawyers, one thing that I've heard specifically in my case um, is that people who have written about my court case have also gotten leg like serious legal threats and, and potentially lawsuits from um, Mr. Soriano. Um, and so we talk about this ripple effect of, of slaps, and I think this is one of them. Um, you know, would I like more mainstream media backing? Absolutely. But do I understand where they're, uh, you know, where they're coming from when they receive these uh, serious legal threats that are, as Claire said, often stamped confidential. Um, you know, you can't can't really blame them for that. And so, um, yeah, slaps have a, a chilling effect not only on uh, the journalists that it that they target, but also um, those who potentially might want to write about the various cases that are going on. Yeah. Okay, um, yes? Yeah, I just want to pick up on, on the, the cost thing as well, because obviously a lot of individual journalists um, face the the horror of uh, bankruptcy, perhaps. Um, and then even we think about smaller organizations and the threat to them, say, for instance, Open Democracy, where I am now, I think our insurance excess is £30,000 for uh, defamation cases. So that's money we have to find first. Uh, but even the organizations we think of as big, you know, media organizations, I know there's people here today from, you know, some of those that have had big cases and it's a constant battle for them too. Their business models are under severe threat. And it's almost like the wider, perhaps even beyond the legal profession, have no concept of this because of the sort of fees that they can charge for these cases. Um, they think that these organizations are good for it. Um, well, they might wake up one day and find there's very few of them around uh, on any side. Uh, so it's fixing that cost issue. And I know the government have a kind of vague proposals around that. 
Um, but how are they going to do that? Because one of the pushbacks on that I heard from a lawyer was that in the environmental cases where there's cost capping, it's really an issue about whether something can go to judicial review. And what you're doing is you're capping the costs for those that are taking the case, the claimants. In this case, we're looking at ways of capping the costs for the defendants. Um, anybody got any suggestions on that one? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a case at the European Court at the moment um, involving a Polish um, couple who, who ran a small newspaper in, in London and reported on a businessman and made various claims. And it was a relatively minor case. And, and the upshot is before they even got into the court, they'd had to, to sell their house to, to cover the, the legal fees for their lawyers, as, uh, as opposed to even dealing with the the law firms that were acting against against them. So it's a real issue and that's that's gone to the European Court, but it's a case that the European Court has already considered in the MGN um, case. And, and we're back again with the question of how the UK um, regulates its its fees in the context of these cases being considered um, again. So it's it's a pretty difficult, um, pretty difficult question. Um, if no one has any more questions, I just wanted to mention a, a case um, a number of cases, actually, from a, a journalist that Media Defence was supporting um, over the last number of years. He was a panelist here last year, João Paulo Cuenca, and, and he's a Brazilian journalist who's faced 143 different lawsuits in in Brazil. He for a tweet that he issued, which was kind of anti Bolsonaro, anti evangelical uh, church tweet. And there was a very considered and coordinated campaign against him where of the 27 states in Brazil, in 26 of those states, um, legal proceedings were issued against him by different members who claimed that he had been that he had defamed them um, in the context of, of this tweet. And they were issued in these 26 different federal states with the requirement under the, the legal procedures in each state that he would have to appear in each case, each time it was it was being considered. And it was only really COVID that, that saved him because he could go online and he could appear online. Otherwise he would have been in, in big trouble. But the, the good news in relation to his case and the situation that he has faced is of those 143 cases, 90 he has either won or they've been dismissed and dismissed is pretty much um, in that context, the same as, as them being won. But it's also acted as a catalyst in two respects. First of all, the public prosecutor, the federal public prosecutor, has now um, begun investigating these types of claims with a view to um, ensuring that this kind of um, uh, litigation, uh, what they call predatory litigation in, in Brazil in the context of these cases, is shut down at a very early stage. And you also have a um, the um, regulatory body of judges who are also kind of interested in how this has happened and, and how this has come to be where he's ended up being sued in in uh, 26 of the 27 different states and 143 different lawsuits so he's at he's at case 90 um it's a hundred percent record um fingers crossed for for Gia paulo cuenca so that's kind of a good news story maybe there was a bit of overreach on the part of the people who tried to <laughs> to, um, to to push against him but in broad terms i think it's a positive outcome um, uh, the stark facts of that case made the, the the authorities react in a way that's we hope beneficial for for journalists um in brazil so we're out of time and with that i'd like to thank uh, scott uh, thank you for getting up very early and thank you for your excellent contribution. Uh, Claire, uh, thanks so much for, for your insights. Uh, and Dario, thank you for, for that excellent um, uh, intervention. And thank you very much uh, to everyone for, for, for coming today. Okay. Thank you.